telescope, <laughs> microscope, macroscope. I'm here to talk about a new scientific instrument, the macroscope. The word macroscope has been in small circulation for almost 40 years in science fiction and in systems thinking. Um, the first use, as I want to use it, was in a paper by uh, Gilman Toll in 2005 called A Macroscope in the Redwoods, in which he described placing a wireless sensor network in a single redwood tree to understand its ecological context. A system to make lots and lots of small observations and computing that allows us to store and analyze the data that we collect, that's a macroscope. So when cell phone data is used to graph population movements in the city, that's a macroscope. And when my friend Ben Lipkowitz uses his computer to make minute records of every single thing he does during the day, that's a macroscope too. Now, Ben is less unusual than he once was, not because he's becoming more like us, but because we're becoming more like Ben. Because there's a lot of tools now that allow us to track almost everything we do, our diet, ovulation, sleep, mood, medication and treatments, cognitive performance. We wear them in our pockets or on our belts. That's a Fitbit that some of you may have seen, a, a digital accelerometer. We put them in our shoes, that's the Nike Plus. We wear them on our wrists, that's a new Jawbone Up, which uh, gives you an activity record. I could just as easily have uh, put a Garmin watch, which some of you may have seen, which is deservedly a very popular self-tracker. We have them in our clothes. Uh, they're going inside our bodies. That goes in a little pot pouch that a surgeon makes, just in your skin. Uh, we even swallow them, and the sensor there is not the green dot, that's a pill. Uh, the size of a, a pill, a, a medicine that you would swallow. The sensor's the tiny black dot that's in the center of the pill. That's from Proteus, and it transmits from inside the body after it's swallowed. Now, the components of the macroscope are familiar, sensors and computing, but its role in our personal lives is new. And it's worth acknowledging the newness of the macroscope because the advent of a new knowledge system is a fateful moment for human beings. We make our tools, but as we make them, they make us. So what's the macroscope doing to us? Here's one vision. The macroscope will make us better in every way, thin, rich, happy, smart, through making it easier for us to conform to expert advice about optimal human existence. Now, this vision is actually quite old, and I'm going to show you a version um, uh, in a minute from the 1930s. But I want to put a couple of contemporary words on it that you may hear. Compliance, that's a healthcare industry word. It means following doctor's orders. Sometimes they soften it a little bit and call it adherence. Uh, feedback, that usually means conforming our behavior to some sort of regulatory ideal or norm. Behavior change, that has a nice kind of 50s Skinnerian resonance. But they all, um, oh, let me go back. They all, they all um, presuppose a kind of model that has an expert on one end and us on the other. Okay, here's the version from the 30s. Uh, would you start it? I'm gonna wait one minute and I can easily go on if it doesn't, if it doesn't start. Three, two, one. Okay, there's a beautiful um, example that you can find on the web in which a psychologist by the name of Donald Laird shows his somnokinetograph, which is a mattress that is linked to a pen and a scrolling piece of paper so that every time somebody turns over in bed, it makes a little mark on the, on the scrolling piece of paper. And the narrator of this video will sort of uh, sonorously uh, explain that when you sleep, you must be completely relaxed. So the flatter the line, the better the sleep. And, um, you know, people had the idea that using tools of measurement, we could improve our behavior. And they've worked on that idea for, uh, you know, uh, well, not, not quite a century. Um, the red line is where people's attention is focused. We have a body of knowledge, and then we have you and I, and the red line is the line of influence, behavior change, feedback. 
Okay, so the question is, is what's in the knowledge box adequate to support all the attention that's going into the influence arrow? Is tossing and turning really an adequate theory of insomnia? For instance, you might ask, maybe tossing and turning is a symptom of insomnia rather than a cause. Well, um, look at obesity. Right now, people are building all kinds of macroscopes for making us eat better, tracking our diet, and giving us recommendations or, or sort of putting something right at that moment where we might make a better choice. And because this vision is basically a 20th century vision grafted onto 21st century's technology, they often reference the gold standard of behavior change programs, which is Weight Watchers. They want to be as good as Weight Watchers, just with computers, so more convenient and um, scalable. The problem is that the long-term data on Weight Watchers is not very good. So we're building systems of influence based on knowledge that has proven inadequate for more than half a century. It's not just a problem with diet. Some of you will be familiar with this research result, which people are discussing quite a bit, a statistical analysis in the human sciences showing that the majority of results in the entire corpus of some fields is unreliable. We have a problem with our knowledge box. Okay, so let's very quickly just ask, where does this leave us? What if most schemes of behavior change are just marketing propaganda and managerial wishful thinking? Is there something that a macroscope can do, something more promising and less dispiriting than just impaling us on the schemes of experts? I'd like to answer that question with a short invitation to join a conversation that started three years ago among people who are interested in the personal meaning of personal data and how we can take these new tools of self-tracking and make them genuinely valuable for us. What began as an informal meeting in the San Francisco Bay Area has become a truly international collaboration, 40 cities in 10 countries. And our research practice is very, very simple. Um, we call the group the quantified self. Quantified stands for computing. And the self is a usefully troublesome word that means the active process of reflection and articulation about what these tools can do. Everybody answers some basic questions. What did you do? How did you do it? And what did you learn? Now, we consider the quantified self to be part of a family of new knowledge practices, sort of a little cousin still at this stage, that includes free software, open science, wikis, all of these practices that are evolving to help us advance knowledge. Perhaps this will give us a chance to also advance the techniques of influence when we're worthy of having good techniques of influence. But before we go crazy with influencing machines, let's try to become a little more intelligent. It's traditional to end these talks with a kind of request. And my request for you is not for any kind of institutional backing or uh, money, for God's sake. It's a request that you begin yourself to help us evolve these tools. And the way to evolve them is to use them, to track something, to try something, to share something, to ask yourself, what did you do? How did you do it? And what did you learn? What did you learn? The telescope is for seeing distant things. The microscope is for seeing small things. And the macroscope is for seeing connections between things. I hope I've extended some of these connections in my invitation today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Mr. Gary Wolf.